Lumine participate in Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Today is the feast of Saint Francis Borgia, um, a, a, a Jesuit saint from the 16th century. Um, he actually was um, a noble of the noble family, a high nobility, and he had been married and had eight children. Uh, and then became a Jesuit priest, and in fact, uh, one of the greatest superior generals of that order. Um, so as usual, uh, he, he had a very good um, upbringing, very pious as a child, and he wanted to enter uh, the monastic life and become a monk, uh, but due to his high status, uh, his family instead um, encouraged him to uh, continue the family procession, uh, profession, and so he was sent to the court of the Holy Roman Emperor, and learned all the ways of, of diplomacy and court, uh, you know, courtly life and so on. And at 19, 19 years old, he um, married a woman of noble estate and, as I mentioned, had eight children. Um, interestingly, he was a very good composer of ecclesiastical music and actually was one of the precursors to uh, Palestrina and the development of polyphony in the church. Uh, so for all, all external um, appearances, this is how he was going to live out his life. Just a good, pious nobleman, large family, um, high estate, um, that was going to be it. Uh, but a change came when he, um, accompanied, um, he was accompanying the emperor on several affairs of a state and was, was given the task of accompanying the uh, Queen Isabella, who had um, she'd been a, a great um, you know, queen in the 15th century, um, she had just died and um, was, was going to be accompanying, um, he had to accompany her body from where she had died to its place of burial. And so um, when they arrived uh, at, at the place where she was to be buried, it was the custom to, um, you know, make sure is this really the person that, that they, they, they say that it is. So they opened the casket and she'd only been dead, well only been dead, a few days, a week, something like that. Uh, but the body had um, uh, decomposed uh, rather rapidly. And Queen Isabella had been reputed to be very beautiful um, during life, but now here she was, um, a rotting corpse. So it says that, that uh, 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 Francis Borgia was so um, uh, uh, taken, was so stricken by the sight, so moved by it um, at the sight of death, and that how everything in this life that we view as beautiful and attractive, no matter how powerful someone appears to be, uh, death makes everybody equal, right? In death, everybody's the same. And how fleeting and, and empty this, the promises and the pleasures of, of this life uh, really are. Uh, so that effected a great conversion in him, and he resolved then and there to renounce his um, worldly life as much as possible. And this was, this was, uh, um, uh, this was gonna be, this is quite a change. Uh, for Francis Borgia was from the, the infamous Borgia family. Uh, and they were, they, were, they were infamous for their intrigues, the power plays, the immorality, the scandal. Um, his great uncle was Caesar Borgia, um, about whom Machiavelli's book, The Prince, was written. And it was about how to gain and control power at all costs. Um, so he was actually also related to Alexander VI, who's noted as one of the worst popes in history uh, due to his immoral way of living. Um, appointing his own illegitimate children as cardinals and bishops, uh, using the papacy to enrich his family, and so on. Um, but Francis Borgia is proof that God can raise up saints um, in, in, in no matter how toxic the environment. Um, so despite this, this family history of these family ties, he was able to become a, a great saint. And I would say, you know, many people are um, concerned with um, uh, the genealogical spirits. Maybe some people have heard of that. Uh, well, you don't have to worry about that. Um, it's not the past that makes, um, that, that could, it's, that's going to affect your future as much as, as it is the present. Right now is what's important about the future, not, oh, my, my great-grandfather was a Mason or my family was this or that. Forget about the family in the past. Um, it's kind of the, the opposite. You know, too many people, especially in the Middle Ages, would think that they were fantastic because they had a, a good past. Oh, my uncle was a knight or my, my parents were of a noble lineage. That doesn't make you a good person, right? Just because you have great people in the past doesn't make you good right now. Likewise, just because there are evil people in your past doesn't make you evil right now. Um, of course, there are, there's always uh, more things to be considered, but, but we need to be convinced of that. Right? We can respond to the grace we have right now 
then anybody can decide they want to be a saint and correspond with God's graces. So um, he would do just that. He would start really changing his life, um, which is already good at that point. It wasn't like he had, was living a bad life at all. It was a very good life. Uh, but he really spent more time in prayer. And not many years after that experience, his wife would end up uh, dying. And he, after making adequate provisions for all of his children, renounced his title of nobility and entered the, the newly founded Jesuit order as a layman. Uh, so he entered the Jesuits, he was working with them, he studied. Uh, very soon he was ordained a priest and at once began a life of such penance and holiness that it was shocking. Uh, he had been in such high estate and now he was uh, the, the, the lowest of novices in, in a, a religious order with no history, right? The Jesuits had just been founded. It wasn't like he was joining the Dominicans that had this long history of, of sanctity. It was his brand new order. So it was, it was, it was very, very um, shocking to the people at the time. Um, <clears throat> and he led a simple and humble life as a priest. He would no longer allow himself to be called by a royal title and refused the ecclesiastical dignities offered to him by several popes. Uh, but his leadership skills were recognized and employed, and he became the third superior general of the Jesuits. Uh, the greatest, uh, uh, the only greater was St. Ignatius himself. Um, he would assign uh, many Jesuits to foreign missionaries. He founded the Gregorian University in Rome, which is still active, and over 12 colleges throughout Europe. Uh, he greatly expanded the Jesuit community and advised kings and prelates on the highest matters of importance. Yet despite all of this incredible business and all this work, he, uh, he had an excellent spiritual life. He would spend hours in prayer each day uh, he ate uh, very rough food, wore a hair shirt, um, used discipline, and slept very little. Um, furthermore, he would go uh, to beg food from houses and endure insults with serenity and patience, volunteered in hospitals to assist the sick and the dying, and he spent time in cleaning and sweeping and all the menial tasks of servants. And this is all from somebody who used to be an... Uh, to get it, I mean, this is, the, this is the 16th century, this is the year 1500s. Uh, members of royal houses, you didn't sweep, you didn't do those menial tasks. That was so far beneath your station as to be insulting, like to your very person. Uh, but, but this is what he engaged in. It, it, it's, it was like he, he um, had that, that vision that, um, it, it, it seems strange to us today. We're so infected, I would say, by the, um, the French Revolution of egalitarianism. Everybody's the same. Everybody's on the same level, which is not true. There is a hierarchy. Uh, so it's hard for us to understand the way that Europe was and the way that the nobility worked and what a condescension it would have been for this kind of a life. Uh, that would have been miraculous in itself, um, forgetting about all the penances and the rough food and so on, just not, um, uh, not clinging to that title of nobility. Uh, it's something that, that um, and for that reason, the humility of God in lowering himself from his station would have been much better understood. For a nobility to understand you know, how high they were above the, 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 the peasants, as it were, um, you know, for God to lower himself to that station, that was an example to all nobility in, in, uh, of everywhere. You know, don't cling to your titles of nobility. So uh, Francis Borgia would, would, would understand that very greatly and, and give that example. Um, it says that his way of life inspired two other men in their own personal pursuits of virtue. Uh, St. Charles Borromeo would look at Francis Borgia as an example, and also um, Antonio uh, Ghislieri, who would become Pope Pius V. Um, he even actually inspired Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, to resign his throne and undertake a life of penance. Um, he's written about by other saints. Teresa of Avila writes about, uh, in her diaries, um, she speaks that she knows of a man of the, who has the highest levels of prayer and ex is experiencing the mystical marriage, and she's talking about Francis Borgia. Uh, that's the other person she's, she's discussing. Um, so he would um, continue to effect great good at every level, and eventually uh, this would, he would become quite sick from his labors and from his fastings. Um, his final mission was traveling to Spain and Portugal uh, to gain cooperation for the Battle of Lepanto at the request of Pius V. 
And he was successful, as we know, uh, that that was a great battle uh, that was won for Christendom. But the strains of travel proved too much for him in his weakened state, and he died in the year 1572 at 61 years of age. Um, St. Francis Borgia has been called the most striking example of a conversion of life since the Renaissance. And he did it, uh, it was accomplished by living a good, a good life, but, but especially by meditating on the reality and inevitability of death. Uh, it was seeing that corpse of Queen Isabel of Spain and knowing that all goodness, uh, all beauty, all power, all riches, uh, all finery, all pleasures, everything in this world ends at death and that is coming for everybody and that is inevitable. Um, and so that is a, is a great help, you know, to meditate upon that um, and upon the, the, the justice and the judgment of God. Um, but it's also helpful uh, to, at the same time, to remember that it's not just negative. At the same time that Francis uh, Borgia was meditating upon that, that hideousness of death and the emptiness, uh, emptiness of this life, if that's all he did, like, you, he would have despaired. Anybody would despair if all you do is meditate upon how awful everything in this life is and how everything's coming to an end, that's gonna lead you to despair. What's the other side? How uh, good God is, the joys of heaven, the richness of heaven, uh, the, the incredible happiness of a life lived for God, even in this life, the, 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 the friendship in heaven, how many people are waiting there for us, uh, all the goodness that can, be, that can be accomplished for love of God, right? It's that flip side of the coin that makes all the difference in the world. And it's those two, it's those two together. Um, you know, Teresa, uh, or Therese of Lisieux, very interesting. It seems that she didn't, she never needed to meditate upon death or um, uh, the, 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 the horrors of sin and so on. It seems that she always um, uh, just meditated upon the love of God and that was enough for her. You know, some people, you read other saints, um, they were constant, like the Redemptorist, Alphonsus the Gory, right? That, that they were constantly preaching about, you know, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. That's the whole point of the Redemptorist, is, is, is to bring people back to their senses by a remember, remembrance of the horrible things that await sinners. So it, it seems like there can be entire um, whole saints in the church that focus on one or the other, uh, but it's always both, right? Both are always there, and both are always present. So don't get caught up either in one or the other, uh, but, uh, um, um, but just focus on Christ. And really, that's it. Um, if you had to get caught up in one or the other, get caught up in God's love, because that's more important. Um, uh, death should move you to God's love. Um, and, and, and the possession of God's love, the, the, the desire for God, it should be the, th the remembrance of death that keeps you from falling away from that. Uh, but in any case, let us um, um, ask for the intercession of all the saints, but especially today, St. Francis Borgia, uh, that maybe we can have something of his second conversion, uh, give our life entirely to God. Uh, remember the emptiness, if we're caught up in this world, the emptiness of the things of this world. Uh, but if, if perhaps, too, we've forgotten the joys or the, the goodness, the gladness that can be ours with heaven, uh, let's ask for hope. Right? hope and belief in the love of God, uh, and that it can be ours if, if we just accept his will in all things. Uh, so may God bless you all in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.